Hello everybody, uh, this is Jono. Like many British kids, I regularly watched Little Britain. Somehow, as well as teenagers, Little Britain attracted children. It's ironic considering the swearing, the sex scenes and the constant vulgarity that was included. I can understand how popular it was at the time, though nowadays it seems much less talked about. First series of Little Britain was brilliant, but by the time series 2 came out, the problem started to fall rather flat. Your broad ones though were quite better. On the whole, the programme is not all bad. Much of my admiration is to do with the characters. Some are awesome, some are plain stupid. Some are memorable, some are more forgettable than others. Some are underrated, some are overrated. Little Britain is a fine show to enjoy now and then. So for nostalgic reasons, I shall identify what I personally regard as the top 10 best and the top 10 worst Little Britain characters that David Walliams and Matt Lucas created. Number 10, Dame Sally Markham and Phyllis Church. Dame Sally goes to show how difficult it can be to write a novel or think of ideas for new novels, especially if they're romantic novels. She hires Miss Grace to type up the words for her while she explains the words she wants typing up. Difficulties are executed perfectly. The humour comes from the fact that Sally cannot seem to reach the minimum number of pages needed, so she tries to think of bizarre ways to extend, i.e. using the entire Bible as part of the synopsis, or ensuring Miss Grace notes down every sentence spoken on the radio, or even plagiarising another novel. I also cackled thinking about a sketch where Sally attempted to start a new novel about after the other one could not be extended and stated, Chapter 1. The End. <laughs> God, I loved it. Phyllis Church, on the other hand, I never enjoyed. Her sketches are so creepy. She pretends that her dog is talking to her, and that the dog wants her to do bad stuff such as stripping or defecating in public, or even vandalism. Her sketches are so repetitive and predictable. You know her dog will encourage her to do something vulgar, and that she'll get into trouble. And there's always this line, she's one crazy bitch. <sighs> Number 9, Jason and Nan and Pat and Don. The Jason and Nan sketches are probably some of the most controversial ones featured in Little Britain. The fact is that teenager Jason is in love with his best friend Gary's grandmother. This sort of thing could suggest paedophilia, but part of the joke is that it's the kid who fancies the woman and not the other way round. Gary's nan is unaware of Jason's affections, even though Jason would do anything to get off of her. At one time, when Gary catches Jason sucking her toes and throws him out, nan is like, Is he a trained chiropodist? Therefore believing that he was just giving a kind massage. Which was absolutely funny. Pat and Don sketches are among some of the most repetitive sketches on the programme, and I'm sorry, but that destroys the humour. And it's no wonder Series 3 was a little crap. Don tries spicy food, which Pat warns him not to because she knows he doesn't like spices. Every time he does so, he breathes and starts shouting gibberish and catchphrases. There were two sketches, and they were all the same claptrap. Number eight, George and Sandra, and Dudley and Ting Tong. George and Sandra are this English married couple who visit America to celebrate their 40th wedding anniversary, but are having trouble communicating. George attempts to make conversation, ad-libbing some pretty amusing things like the short fact. Fat ugly monkeys, probably female. Sandra doesn't say a word throughout, which brings me a smile to my face. To extend the humour, George, after failing to get a word out of his wife, loses his patience and states something nasty like, I'm just waiting for you to die. <laughs> which could signal that their marriage is kind of falling apart. 
after celebrating 40 good years. Maybe they're a little repetitive, but they are most certainly funny compared to Dudley and Ting Tong. Dudley and Ting Tong are just cruel examples for a comedy sketch. Do people really arrange for a foreign woman just to do something dirty with them? Do they really treat them that way? Do they really trade them? What the hell is wrong with British men? Is it just sex, sex, sex? Come on, Dudley and Ting Tong are not even funny. Ting Tong shares the secret with Dudley. Dudley orders her out, but then gives in. This re repetition is as boring as hell. The abroad ones were better, but my god, when Ting Tong done turns Dudley's home into a Thai restaurant, I thought, serves Dudley right for treating Ting Tong appallingly. I know Little Britain is a comedy, but I find it impossible to like these characters, and saw no reason why they was created in the first place. Number 7. Kelsey Grammar School and David Thomas. When Series 2 came, I thought I saw a Kelsey Grammar School sketch. But then watching the series again, I discovered that it wasn't there. It's a shame because sketches from the first series were awesome. And I'll tell you why. There's plenty of understandable jokes included uh, including when it comes to when it comes to schooling, including very short break times, and a teacher Mr Cleves is an awesome character. During a literature lesson he instructs his students to read the next parts of the book and interrupts for the next student to read without any allowing the others to finish the sentence in the book. Then after judging their poor performance, he takes over and is dis and it is discovered that he can't even read. <laughs> Funny thing for a teacher. The test sketches are among some of the best. Mr Cleves tells students to be silent but then makes noises with his saxophone back in cleaner and fireworks. <laughs> There's one sketch which does not feature him. It takes place in a careers office and a careers advisor is a robot. Who remind, reminds the student that it is it's a race that its race will inherit the planet, which I've always found interesting when I um tried each time I predict the future. It's a shame that Lucas and David Williams didn't carry on with the school sketches because they are awesome com compared to Dab. Thomas. And speaking of David Thomas, do you think the jokes about homosexuality are getting tired now? Well, I think so. David is just an excuse for gay humour. He started off fine, but as the series progressed, unlike Henny Craig and Carol Beer, who get better and better, David got lamer and lamer. I'm sorry, but there's nothing hilarious I can think of about a so-called homosexual who wants to be the only gay in the village just to get attention from the population of the fictional Welsh village Landui Breffy. I saw The Simpsons and it wasn't like ooh look at me I'm a Nazi boy. This character named Carl who I saw on one episode wasn't like that but I knew he was gay just as soon as he kissed Homer and patted him on the butt. David just has an attention span just to annoy residents and of course viewers. He dismisses all the real gays as not gay enough to fill in slots and dismisses any harmless statements as homophobic. I can't feel any empathy for him. I don't even find him that funny. I just want to strangle him. Plus the latest sketches are, more, are far more forgettable compared to the ones in series 1. David is such an overrated character. Number 6. The World Record Attempt and Harvey Pincher. The World Record Attempters were among the highlights of series 1. Each episode ended with two guys, each named Ian, attempting to break a record, including tallest man, most people in mini, shortest time to eat a bowl of boiled eggs which is my favourite one. Each time they attempt a world record, they become unsuccessful. Using a top tall hat to beat Robert Wadlow doesn't count, nor does using sellotape to build a giant house of cards, but they do not seem to give up. They always get a laugh out of me. 
Harvey Pincher is just plain creepy. When I first saw his sketches, I liked them, but looking back, they were just stupid. He often acts like a child and asks for his mum for Betty, as opposed to breast milk. The only time I laughed was when his mother ran out of breast milk and he turned to his gran um, in order to um, get more breast milk. Little Britain seemed to just be gross for the sake of being gross. Yeah, I admit, the young ones Bottom and South Park were gross at times, but at least they worked. Each sketch consisting of Harvey is all the same thing. Thank God he didn't appear in Series 3. But why did they have to bring him back for Little Britain USA? Number 5. Kenny Craig and Desiree DeVere Oh, David and Matt, why couldn't you bring Kenny Craig for Series 3? He's way better than David Thomas. And I'll tell you why. Okay, you know he's a, going to hypnotise someone, but he's a hypnotist. What do you expect? And each time he hypnotises someone, he mentions strange things, and or he tricks them out of or into something. And that is funny. Sometimes afterwards, he mistakes something, or they don't fall for it. For instance, he tricks his girlfriend into not ordering lobster or champagne. She orders other items, but when it comes to Kenny, he says, oh, I'm not really hungry, I'll just have the lobster and a bottle of champagne. Tell me he ain't funnier than Daffod. On two occasions, he hypnotizes Mum. At one time, to cheat into a Scrabble game, and in order to watch an episode of Thundercats. He often uses his skills to cheat into something to earn money, and for excuses, excuses to do something in particular. Good going. Desiree DeVere was one of the things I didn't like about Series 3. She was annoying, and she really ruined the sketches that featured Bubbles Severe. The Bubbles sketches were going fine until Death Ray came along and destroyed Bubbles' new jokes. She was too in your face compared to Bubbles. That's all I have to say. Number 4. Mr. Man and Roy and Mark and Tom. The shop sketches are among the best of the regular ones in Little Britain ever to be created. Mr. Man, the customer, would often enter the shop, run by Roy, the shopkeeper, and ask for a ridiculously specific item, which makes these sketches so hilarious. To add to the humour, Roy would lazily look for an item and call for his um, unseen limbless, life, or limbless wife for help. Items Mr. Man ordered include a magazine associate shaded with foot pain, a painting of a disappointed horse, and a video of a crime film starring Chevy Chase and Rick Moranis with a 15 certificate. <laughs> Often Mr. Man doesn't get the items, except on a couple of occasions, one where he buys a record of a man covering Nelly Furtado's hits on banjo, and another where he buys a painting of a displeased owl. Each time he felt disappointed, which turns out all he wants to do is annoy Roy. And that's also one of the reasons why it somehow reminds me of the Monty Python franchise. Speaking of items, have you noticed that on each sketch Roy's shop has a different theme? Toys, dating, films, books, records, magazines, etc. It's like Roy hasn't sold much, so after a, an apparent low economy, he's having to change businesses. On only two occasions has he snapped at man. Get out or I will strangle you. Strangle you. <laughs> man, I love these sketches. Mark and Tom I've never truly enjoyed. It seems like that David and Matt are going too overboard on the new jokes, which is almost just as bad as their portrayal of David Thomas. Yeah, we've seen the gay humour all before. Look, I know I like Bubbles to fear until Desiree screwed it up. But then two guys show how overboard this style is getting. Plus, they're pretty forgettable. Once you see a sketch of theirs, you probably won't remember them. Number 3. Denver Mills 
and Michael Dinner. Denver Mills is a retired athlete who is made to give speeches after um, retiring from his sport. One at hospital with patients with leprosy, another at a state school. Most of the humour comes from his cynicism on the fact that his celebrity status is fading out and not many people remember him for winning a silver medal during the Olympics. He also demonstrates how hard it is to give speeches. Whilst rehearsing or giving his speech, Denver finds that certain statements demonstrate political incorrectness or just plain inappropriate elements. Then he would attempt to ch chicken out. Turns out fame isn't everything. <laughs> I would also recommend the Bing Gordon sketches. Um, Bing Gordon, he's um, sort of uh, a little bit like Denver Mills, except he's a, an American um, retired astronaut. Apparently the eighth man on the moon. There was not one sketch of Denver Mills's that I hated one bit or could not get a laugh out of, unlike Michael Dinner. His sketches are so bland and forgettable. During every sketch, he just sits there in the restaurant ordering normal food and then ordering something made by brand, i.e., your keys or uh, tango or whatever. I wish I could laugh, but they're so repetitive and all the same, and I'm pretty sure I saw some of those in other comedy shows. Probably one's Pardon or two Ronnie's. Can't really remember at the moment. But there's but the point is that there's nothing different about any of his stuff. It's just the same clap trap crap. Excuse my language. Number two. Matthew Waterhouse and Sir Norman Fry. Have you ever wondered that Matthew Waterhouse could be a contestant on Dragon's Den? He's a would-be inventor who comes up with bizarre and unconvincing ideas for new musicals, games and serials, or even plagiarising ideas, which like Denver Mills did not fail to impress me whatsoever. On two occasions he comes in the wrong place where he, when he tosses out ideas for games, Matt Lucas's character explains that he's, his um, company imports car tires and does not produce board games. That brought me, a, brought me a huge giggle. As did the time when Matthew mistook a minicab salesman for a kissogram agent. Speaking of kissograms, some of his ideas are based on George Bernard Shaw and John McCarthy, which I think was so intelligently scripted that probably only a university graduate would understand. Oh, and did I mention the bit where he introduces an idea for a musical based on a musical? God, that was awesome. As for Sir Norman Fry, why did I rank him so high in the worst section? I don't dislike him just because he's a conservative MP. I mean, personally, I support Labour. It's mainly because of the repetition and forgettability in regards to his sketches. While Matthew Waterhouse gets better and more memorable, Norman Fry's scenes are all the same dull thing, a random speech to the public which is hard to follow through. Some of the elements gave me a chuckle once in a while, but once you go through a sketch of his, the chances are you won't remember them one bit. I know I keep saying this, but yet yeah, some some characters are pretty forgettable, as I said. Before I reveal the all-time best and the all-time worst characters, I shall leave you some honourable mentions. and some dishonourable mentions. And number one, Des K and Mrs Emery. God, I love Des K. Sometimes I imagine being a children's TV presenter myself. 
That's probably one of the reasons why I like this guy. These sketches are so original. They explore what life would be like if you transferred from celebrity fame to a normal domestic status. And there's not many media products like that. Not only is Des K hilarious, but I sometimes feel sorry for him. He's been made redundant from television following a snag with two rivals of his, known as the Bubble Twins, apparently back in the late 1980s, which was certainly dif a difficult period for many Brits thanks to the Thatcherism. In order to earn a living, he finds himself working in a store similar to B&Q. He would do anything to entertain children again, and attempts to interest as many people he meets as possible. But not many seem to care, with the exception of one co-worker of his who does, does remember his shows, though he does get put off when Dead explains to the Bubble Twins his homosexuality acts were the reason for the fun bus's cancellation. I would also recommend you try and get hold of the deleted sketch, where he enters a children's hospital. It may be controversial, but it is also hilarious. Trust me. And speaking of controversy, Mrs. Emery was the character I was least looking forward to reviewing. Oh god, do I hate this creation. Okay, she's an OAP, she's got a bladder problem, but like Michael Dinner, normal Norman Fry, and Pat and Don, her sketches are so goddamn repetitive. Every place he, she goes, she uncontrollably urinates on the floor. Oh, come on. The young ones Bottom and South Park were funny compared to this. They were, they were ap there was absolutely no reason for Mrs. Emery to be created in the first place. She was a major problem with the third series, which just happens to be gross for the sake of being gross. Due to the repetitiveness, there is nothing that memorable in regards to any of her sketches. Of course the first third series is not all bad, but if you decide to buy it on video slash DVD, I would personally skip certain sketches, including that old disgusting bat. So there you have it, a personal rankings for the best and worst characters of Little Britain. These are just personal opinions, but free to share some of yours. Uh, you can subscribe to uh, Jono9989 on YouTube. If there were characters you feel disappointed not to be included, as Eric Idle once said, always look on the bright side of life.